everyone, and happy Easter. Welcome to Grace Church, everyone. We're so glad that you are joining us today. My name is Erica, and I'm the Discipleship Pastor. And I am Brittany, and I get to be the Creative Pastor here at Grace. We have a few announcements just for you. We are thrilled to share that Rooted will be starting back up. Rooted is our 10-week discipleship program here at Grace, and it starts April 11th. Yeah, and if you're a young adult in the area, we would love to invite you to our young adult group, Thursday, April 15th. Join us at 7 p.m. here at Grace for a good time. Women of the Word Spring Session starts April 13th and April 15th. We will be studying stories of faithful women from the New Testament. Go girls. Go girls. And Generation Grace is going strong every Wednesday at 7 p.m. G2 is our youth ministry here at Grace. All middle school and high school students are invited to join us every week. We love our youth. Yes, we do. Looking to pay off debt, save, or invest in the future? Then Financial Peace is for you. It is launching April 20th right here at Grace. Amazing. Hey parents, save the date for BBS June 28th through July 2nd. And save the date for Wild West Family Camp July 23rd through the 25th. Next week, we are starting a new sermon series studying the book of 1 John. You are invited to join us and learn with us. We can't wait. Church, let's pray before we worship. God, we just thank you so much for today. Lord, we thank you for what you did by sending your son down to die for us. God, I thank you for Easter and the fact that we get to pause and celebrate and remember what you did. Such a powerful moment. God, we just praise you and we thank you, Lord. God, I pray right now, wherever people are at, wherever they're watching from, Lord, that you would come and you'd meet them in their homes, in their cars, in their workplaces, Lord, and just be with them. God, we thank you for this online community. We just um, are so thankful for them. Lord, we pray all this in your mighty name. Amen.
is crowned with thorns, he is crowned with glory now. The Savior knelt to wash our feet, now at his feet.
Every time I try to make it on my own Every time I try to stand and start to fall And all those lonely roads that I have traveled on There was Jesus When the life I built came crashing to the ground Friends I had were nowhere to be found I couldn't see it then, but I can see it now That was Jesus In the waiting, in the searching, in the healing, in the hurting Like a blessing buried in the broken pieces Every minute, every moment, where I've been and where I'm going, even when I didn't know it, I couldn't see it. There was Jesus. For this man who needs amazing kind of grace, for forgiveness at a price I couldn't pay.
Hello, my name's Dave, and I get to be the pastor here at Grace Church, and I want to welcome you as we celebrate Easter, celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I especially want to welcome those online, and if you happen to be online at the 9.30 or 11 o'clock service, make sure you take advantage of the online hosts that are there ready to serve you. And, and again, no matter where you're at, and join us I am just so thankful that we can celebrate this amazing event called the resurrection. Uh, it is the most important thing, I think, in the history of the world. It, it, is, it is the one thing that all of us face. All of us face an enemy called death. And Jesus Christ conquered that enemy, and we get to celebrate. Uh, the resurrection truly is the center of our faith. Uh, Christianity is not based on just good teaching or being good or anything like that. It is based on the event called the resurrection. And it is worthy to celebrate. It is worthy to sing songs. It is worthy to rejoice because... He is risen, and we can rejoice in our Savior and our Lord. It, it is because Jesus conquered death, because he rose from the grave, that, that we listen to his teachings. It's because he conquered death that we listen and want to be people who follow him, follow the one who loved us first, who came to us, and that we receive him as Lord and God. Again, all of our faith comes back to the resurrection. Now, now there, I know there's skeptics. Really, think, people think, oh, could it be really true that Jesus rose from the grave? In fact, I, I think that everybody who's a follower of Jesus at some time or another was skeptical of it. And so if you're skeptical of the resurrection, you're perfectly qualified to be a follower of Jesus, and I'm glad that you, you're tuning in. And, and I want to give you some reasons why it's reasonable to believe in the resurrection. And the first reason that it's reasonable to believe in the resurrection is actually the story itself. You see, the Easter story goes like this that there were some women who went to the grave early in the morning and discovered that the tomb was empty and Jesus was not there. They actually witnessed the resurrected Jesus. And it was women who first carried the good news that Jesus is alive. Now, if this story was a story that had been made up with the idea that people wanted to fool people, that they wanted to tell a lie that people would believe, they would not tell this story. Because in that culture, at that time, the testimony of women was not uh, credible. It was not viewed as credible. In fact, the testimony of women wasn't even uh, 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 something that they could, you could submit in a court of law. So if you were making up a story that you were in hopes that people were to, were, were to believe, you would make up the story that would say that men were the ones who discovered the empty grave. And, and the only reasonable explanation that we have the story the way it is written is this. That's the way it happened. There were women who went to the tomb and saw that it was empty. Later men saw that it was empty, but first it was women who carried the good news that Jesus was alive. It's the story itself that causes us to recognize the fact that, that it is a believable story. And then there's the little brother James. Now, now think about it for just a little, little bit. See, Jesus had some younger siblings, one of which was James. And, and think with me what it would have been like to be the younger brother of Jesus, growing up in the same household. I, I wonder how many times he was told, James, why can't you be more like your brother Jesus? I mean, think about it. And we, we follow James in the story of the Gospels and, and 
during that time when Jesus was doing his public ministry, when he was teaching and even doing the miraculous, James didn't believe. He, 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 was, he was not a follower of Jesus. And in fact, uh, the scripture tells us that at one time, he actually even questioned whether or not he was sane. It, I mean, he was questioning his sanity. And, and, and when we step back and think about it, what would it take for you to believe that your brother was the sinless son of God? Well, for James, it took the resurrection. Because it was only after the resurrection that James recognized Jesus for who he said he was. In fact, the story goes that Jesus actually made sure that he had connected with James after his resurrection. And James became a fully devoted follower of Jesus after the resurrection. And to me, again, is one of those credible, reasonable reasons why we can believe the resurrection. Now, I could go on and on, but the reality is this. The bottom line is this. People who witnessed the resurrection of Jesus were willing to die because of what they said they saw. They saw the resurrected Jesus. Now, the only uh, reasonable explanation for their willingness to die was because they actually saw Jesus alive and death was not anything that they feared any longer. You know, it's one thing to tell a lie. It's a whole nother thing to be willing to die for a lie. And they were willing to die because, because death was no longer something they feared. Now, the early followers of Jesus were, were not part of some religious elite. Uh, they weren't really special in any way. They, they were very ordinary, very regular people from all kinds of backgrounds. And because they witnessed the resurrected Jesus, it changed their lives. They became bold, they became courageous, they, they began, uh, be, became committed, committed fully to, be, to follow Jesus. And they continued to do the works of Jesus. Now, now we have a, a book in the scripture called the book of Acts. And it's the continual work of, of, of the disciples after Jesus and after his resurrection. And, and just a few weeks later, and that's where I want to take you today, is just a few weeks later, uh, the book of Acts tells us about Peter and John uh, who are going up to the temple to pray one day and they see a crippled man, a, a man who's actually begging for money because he can't work, because he's crippled. And, and, and Peter makes this amazing statement. He says, Silver and gold, I, I don't have any of that. I don't, I don't have money that you need. However, in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And Peter reached over and, and took him by the hand and pulled him up. And this man began to walk and run. And you can imagine he is healed and there is quite a commotion. And everybody in the crowd notices what's going on. And, and, and Peter and John begin to teach about Jesus. And, and that's where I want to take you and pick up the story right then. It's found in Acts chapter 4, and this is what it says. The priest and the captain of the temple guards and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. And they were greatly disturbed. I mean, they are ticked off. They're mad. They're upset. Because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus. Now catch this. They were proclaiming the resurrection of the dead. They weren't just talking about forgiveness or love or peace. No, no, no. The main focus of what they were talking to the crowd about was that Jesus Christ is resurrected. There, there is now a resurrection of the dead. Now it goes on, the story goes on and says they seized Peter and John and because it was evening, they put him in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed. Now I want you to see this. 
And the number of men grew to about 5,000. Now we're told that a couple weeks earlier, there were 3,000 people who had come to know Jesus. Now added to that another 5,000 people. So already the church in Jerusalem is exploding. There's over 8,000 plus who are part of these, this new group of people who are following the resurrected Jesus. The story goes on. And it says, the next days, the rulers, of the, uh, rulers and teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there. And so was Caiaphas and John and Alexander and the other men of the high priest family. Now, let's stop. This is the same group of people that a few weeks earlier had Jesus executed. This is a powerful group of people that have a lot of political strings they can pull. This is the group of people that Jesus stood in front of. Now James and John are standing before this same group that had Jesus executed. And they had Peter and John brought before them and begin to question them. By what power And by what name did you do this? Now I love what they say as they declare this. And then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to this cripple and ask how he was healed, then let this, uh, then know this, you and all the people of Israel. It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised. Again, the central message is the resurrection of Jesus. God raised him from the dead, that this man stands before you and is healed. Let's go on as Peter declares, and he says, He, Jesus, Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the capstone. Jesus is the capstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. And it goes on and says this, and then they saw when they saw the courage, the courage of Peter and John, and they realized that they were unschooled. I mean, Peter and John were unschooled. They were, in fact, ordinary men, and that they were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could not see, uh, since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, There was nothing they could say. It's a fantastic and wonderful story. And and I want to take you back to verse 13. It says, when they saw the courage, when they saw the courage of Peter and John, they realized they were unschooled, ordinary men. And that they were astonished. They were blown away. Because they took, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Now, now again, I want you to think with me the group of people that Peter and John are, are standing in front of. Uh, they are the highest authority of the religion of the day. They are the educated, the intellectual, the well-studied. They are the best of the best. These are the people that if anybody had a religious question, they would go and ask this group of people. They were the ones who set the stage, as it were. And for, to have Peter and John standing before them and telling them about the resurrection, telling them about salvation, telling about them about things that they had missed... It would be like, it would be like me standing before the Supreme Court and, and lecturing them about law. Or it would be like me going before a group of doctors who are brain surgeons or heart surgeons and telling them how to do surgery. Or it would be like me standing before a group of atomic scientists and explaining to them the subparticles of an atom. I mean, it would be absolutely incredible because look, these were unschooled ordinary. 
But the only thing, the only thing they had going for themselves is that they had been with Jesus. And being with Jesus changes everything. It changes everything. Now Peter's bold before this group of people and and he says to them, Jesus is the stone that the builders rejected, which has become the capstone. Jesus is the one that you've rejected, but he is in fact the capstone. The capstone, this is the stone that is the most important stone in the building. It's sort of an anchor stone, as it were. Uh, it, it, refer, it refers to uh, a, a stone where two walls come together. If you have a wall coming this way and a wall coming this way, and you have the cornerstone, the capstone, it's where everything comes together. I, I like to think of it like where heaven and earth comes together, there's Jesus. This capstone is like a, a wedge-shaped stone that stands at the high point of an archway that if that stone w w wasn't there, if it was somehow removed, the whole archway would collapse. Now, here's the reality. I'm either letting Jesus hold my life together or I'm rejecting him and trying to hold it together together myself. See, loved ones, Jesus is the capstone, and he can be your capstone. They declare this amazing truth that salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name in heaven given to men by which we must be saved. There's a lot of people and a lot of things that offer salvation. Only Jesus can give salvation. Only Jesus can give salvation. Salvation is this idea of deliverance. It's a freedom, a freedom from my sin, from my past, from my fears. And only coming to Jesus can give me salvation. Jesus did what I could never do on my own. The, the way, uh, the way he, he gave his life, he gave his life for my sins so that I can receive forgiveness and I can receive a relationship with God and I can know him as father and I can actually have God. God as the Holy Spirit is very present in me and he can be present in your life. Salvation is available to me and it's available to you because of what Jesus Christ has done. I'm not a follower of Jesus. I'm not a Christian because I live in America or because my mother was a Christian or that I even go to church. Going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than uh, swimming in the ocean makes you a fish. I mean, it's just what makes you a follower of Jesus is that you have put in your faith, your trust in what Jesus Christ has done. And when I put my faith in what he has done, and when I begin to follow him, the one who paid the price for my sins, I can have a relationship with God. I can be alive in him. And I can enter into what the scripture calls eternal life. And that eternal life isn't uh, only when I die later on. I can actually enter into eternal life right now. And you can enter into that right now. Jesus invites me, he invites us to put our faith, to put our trust in him, to follow him, to, to allow him to be the capstone that holds our life together that holds our life together when everything is falling apart. Jesus is our capstone. Now, what I love 
so love about this story is this. Jesus took ordinary people. Ordinary people like Peter and John. Ordinary people like me. And ordinary people like you. He takes ordinary people. And he calls them his children. He calls them his beloved He calls them his friend. I don't know where you're at in your journey in Christ. I just want to invite you now that no matter where you're at, if you're never put your faith in Christ or you know that you're away from him today, I want to invite you to say a prayer. I want to invite you to pray and know this, that the Lord Jesus hears your prayer. Now let's pray together and would you pray with me these, this prayer. Lord, I believe that you're alive. I now put my trust and my faith in you. I ask that you forgive me of my sins. I choose from this day forward to follow you. You are my Lord and my Savior. And I thank you, Lord, for your very presence in my life. And I pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. This Easter, I want to declare a blessing to you. The Lord bless you. The Lord, he will keep you for his face shines upon you. You are his beloved. You are his children. Now this day, walk with a heart of rejoicing and celebration for Jesus Christ, our Lord, is resurrected. So you walk knowing his presence and throughout this day and throughout this week that you be very aware of the presence of the living God. For he is with you and has promised never to forsake you. Be his child this day, this week, in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. We love you. We're praying for you. And I, again, encourage you to celebrate this Easter in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Sometimes on this journey, I get lost in my mistakes. What looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength. My story isn't over, my story's just begun. And failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does. Yeah, failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does. Lay your burdens down Here in the Father's house Check your shame at the door Sit and welcome many more You're in the Father's house Arrival's not the end game, the journey's where you are. You never wanted perfect, you just wanted my heart. And the story isn't over, if the story isn't good. Failure's never final when the Father's in the room. Failure's never final when the Father's in the room.
prodigals come home The helpless find hope Love is on the move When the father's in the room Prison doors fling wide The dead come to life Love is on the move When the father's in the room Miracles take place Thank you for joining us online today. We would love to connect with you. If you have any questions or would like more information, let us know in the chat or visit gracechurch360.org. Amazing. Another way to connect with us is on Instagram or Facebook. Grace Church, we hope you have a happy, happy Easter. Easter. Bye. Bye.